It is a truth universally acknowledged that some books will change your life. Slaughterhouse Bob, isn't that an awful name? Oh yeah, it's a great book. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 books to read before you die. Does it burn, man? Does it burn? For this list, we're looking at books that may heavily influence your perspective and outlook on life, on yourself, and on the people around you. We're looking exclusively at novels today, so we won't be including novellas like Le Petit Prince or lengthy poems like The Odyssey. I conquered Troy! Me, Odysseus! A mortal man of flesh and blood and bone and mind! Number 10. The Grapes of Wrath. John Steinbeck. There ain't nobody gonna push me off my land. This classic novel focuses on a family whose farm is seized by the bank during the Great Depression, a fate that befell countless people during that time. Unemployed, destitute, and hoping only for an opportunity to work to pay for food and a roof over their heads, the Joad family follows empty rumors of jobs across the country, slowly starving to death. Maybe 20 days work and maybe no days work. We ain't got it till we get it. Nobel Prize winner John Steinbeck is renowned for capturing the terrible realities of the Great Depression, and he does a heartrending job exploring the hardships, desperate dreams, and unwavering love of the 1930s, as well as shining light on the social and economic injustice that still exists today in many parts of the world. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. Number 9. Slaughterhouse Five or The Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death. Kurt Vonnegut. Billy, you time tripping again? <laughs> I can always tell, you know, when you've been time tripping. Kurt Vonnegut's semi-autobiographical satire is not what you'd expect from a World War II novel. Protagonist Billy Pilgrim is unstuck in time, and his story bounces between the atrocities of war and his later life as a veteran. Not to mention the time he spends as a prisoner on planet Tralfamador after being abducted by aliens. Welcome to the planet Tralfamador, Mr. Pilgrim. In spite of the wacky adventure and deceptively light tone, the book is drenched in the sorrow and trauma that Vonnegut experienced firsthand in the Dresden bombing during the Second World War. It looked like the end of the world. What looked like the end of the world, Mr. Pilgrim? Dresden. After the bombing. From its dry humor to its flights of whimsy to its crazy storyline, Slaughterhouse Five will change the way you think about both war and humanity. We've just had a baby boy. Look at him. <laughs> Isn't he beautiful? Number eight, Great Expectations, Charles Dickens. Tell us your name, quick. Okay. Once more, give him out. Oh, no, sir, please. You've got wheels on you, boy. You've got wheels on you. As the title suggests, you can pick up this book with very high expectations, and you won't be disappointed. Charles Dickens' classic Bildungsroman about a young boy named Pip is emotional and exciting, and includes escaped convicts, gothic scenery, and ghost-like old ladies. Take my hand. Walk with me. When a mysterious benefactor unexpectedly grants him a fortune, Pip goes from being a poor country orphan to a rich heir in England. From there, the book shows how his newfound wealth influences his frame of mind, not to mention his relationship with his family and friends. John Cleese, there's really no need to be so conscientious in emptying your glass. Because the room should never touch your nose, Joe. It all comes together into a complex exploration of class, presumption, and charity. It was like that old woman in Great Expectations, that Miss Havisham in her rotting wedding dress and her torn veil, taking it out on the world because she'd been given the go-by. Number 7, 1984, George Orwell. To our leader. That our eternal allies in Set in a totalitarian society with constant government surveillance, the novel that coined the term Big Brother remains the ultimate dystopia. 1984 twists with spies, fear, and mass manipulation, while protagonist Winston desperately tries to find a way to remain an individual without being caught by the Thought Police. In a world where even your thoughts are monitored and where you are obliged to love Big Brother and to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5, Individuality is rare and precious, but is it worth the risk? Freedom is the freedom to say two plus two equals four. The novel is particularly relevant today, where there are cameras everywhere. 6079 Smith W. Yes, you. Bend lower. You're not trying. It's a book that will mess with your mind in the best possible way and make you question everything you know. You should try reading Orwell's 1984. I have. It's a great book. It really awakened me in high school. I think kids should be forced to read it. Me too. Number six, Harry Potter series, J.K. Rowling. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? A wizard. This is the series that defined a generation. 
For 10 years, children and adults alike waited with bated breath for the next installment of this fantasy series so that they could find out what would befall Harry and his friends in their fight against you-know-who. We can expect great things from you. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Harry may only be 11 in the first book, but this is definitely not just a series for children. From the complex characters to the imaginative world and its sparkling humor, Harry Potter will continue to thrill readers of all ages. I'm a massive Harry Potter fan. What? Yes! You'll tear through this series faster than Hermione can read Hogwarts A History. I read about it in Hogwarts A History. Number 5. The Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger. It's called Catcher in the Rye, and it has some very risque parts. All right. The Catcher in the Rye has achieved almost legendary status since it was first published in the mid-20th century, not least because John Lennon's murderer was carrying a copy of the novel in his pocket. I'm going to kill John Lennon. It's certainly a dark book, but a dark book well worth reading, and worth rereading if you only skim through it in high school. Teenage Holden Caulfield, supreme unreliable narrator and anti-hero, struggles with ideas of innocence and experience as he deals with adolescence, his distant parents, and the death of his brother. All told from inside a rest home. Young Hinckley, the whiz kid who shot Reagan and his press secretary, said, if you want my defense, all you have to do is read Catcher in the Rye. With a protagonist that's both incredibly jaded and beautifully naive in his desire to protect children from the depressing reality of the world and from the corrupt, manipulative, phony adults, the novel's impact on pop culture is undeniable. Ever since I read Catcher in the Rye, I've been having these blackouts. Crazy thoughts of wanting to kill the phonies. Number 4. Wuthering Heights, Emily Bronte. Lily, I'm very unhappy. Prepare yourself for romance with a capital R, including obsession, revenge, and elements of the supernatural. Through the loops of the double frame and several unreliable narrators, this nonlinear story weaves its way across the stormy, treacherous moors of England. It also sees ghosts and memories of childhood trauma haunt two generations, while the cruel Heathcliff seeks revenge on everyone who wronged him and separated him from his soulmate, Kathy. Lily, I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure anymore, and I'm always a pleasure to myself. Kathy is dead by the time the story begins, but her spirit still wanders the moors, tapping at windows and asking to come inside. This brilliant novel rests somewhere between doomed love story and psychological horror, complete with an incredibly vivid atmosphere and the ultimate Byronic hero. I read Wuthering Heights every Christmas. It's my favorite book. Number three, Moby Dick, or The Whale, Herman Melville. It lights our way to the white whale! One of the most important books of the 19th century, Moby Dick tells the adventures of wandering sailor Ishmael and his voyage on the whaling ship commanded by Captain Ahab. Ahab is on an insane quest for revenge, against a whale of all creatures. From hell's heart, I sympathy for hate's sake, I spit my last breath at thee, thou damned whale! In his poetic, almost biblical tale of madness and vengeance, Melville tackles the relationship between humans and the natural world. The first line, Call Me Ishmael, is one of the most famous openings ever written, and the rest of the book deserves just as much attention. Call me Ishmael. Number 2. Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen. And may I introduce Mr. Darcy of Pemberley and Derbyshire. The story of Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy is a classic for a reason. Pride and Prejudice isn't just a brilliant romance, it's also equal parts comedy and scathing social satire. I thought the poetry was the food of love. Of a fine stout love it may, but if it is only a vague inclination, I'm convinced one poor sonnet will kill it stone dead. So what do you recommend? Everyone has heard of Mr. Darcy, perhaps the most famous romantic hero of all time, but the other characters are just as compelling. From strong-willed Lizzie and her four sisters to the grotesque Lady Catherine and the arrogant Mr. Collins. As the title suggests, the book is a complex exploration of different kinds of pride and prejudice. And would you consider pride a fault or a virtue? That I couldn't say. Such as the ways in which they are imbued in Western culture, and the ways in which they can be overcome. Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice, she was too proud. Oh, I, I thought you hated Pride and Prejudice. Or was she too prejudiced and Mr. Darcy is too proud? I... Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Gender treachery. I like girls. Christ, they could have sent you to the colonies. They don't send you to the colonies if your ovaries are still jumping. What you don't understand is that it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. 
You have it backwards. It's better to live on your feet than to die on your knees. Okay, listen up. Whoever holds the conch gets to speak. That's the rule. Is this like assembly, sir? Yeah. Except anybody who wants to speak gets to. Do you remember what you asked me the other day? If I ever read the books I burn, remember? Mm -hmm. Last night I read one. When people have the freedom to choose, they choose wrong every single time. Number one, To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee. It was a sin to kill a mockingbird. Why? Well, I reckon because mockingbirds don't do anything but make music for us to enjoy. Set in the southern United States, Pulitzer Prize winning To Kill a Mockingbird is narrated by a character named Scout. There was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, no money to buy it with. Although Maycomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. As she tries to navigate childhood, she watches her father, a lawyer defending a black man, try desperately to use his own power as a white man to bring change to their racist town. In the name of God. Do your duty. This book sheds devastating light on a white male power structure that still rules in many, if not all, parts of the world. Its persistent social relevance, complex characters, and excellent prose are just a few of the reasons you should definitely give it a read. I'm reading To Kill a Mockingbird for the third time. My friends make fun of me. I think I'm the only girl in the whole school who doesn't like the Twilight books. Do you agree with our list? I've told you everything already. What is it you want me to know? What's your favorite book? For more literary top tens published daily, be sure to subscribe to Ms. Mojo. Once you've got hold of your broom, I want you to mount it and grip it tight, you don't want to be sliding off the end.